you know, Yashua is the, uh, the head of the Montreal Institute for Learning Algorithms uh, at the University of Montreal. Uh, truly needs no introduction, so I think I will step down at this point. <laughs> Thank you, Yashua. Hello. So I'm going to tell you about uh, fairly high level thoughts uh, regarding approaching human level AI. Let's see. And in particular, focus on the question of language understanding, which is uh, one of the key ingredients for uh, building intelligent machines. And which, as, as Josh was saying this morning, I think. Um, we, we've underestimated how hard that's going to be, and maybe we haven't taken the right direction. Uh, a lot of natural language research these days is done with machine learning and large text corpora, sometimes huge corpora, for example, for machine translation, uh, something I've been working on. And what I'm going to tell you is I think even though we can make some incremental progress by continuing this way, uh, it's not going to be enough. It's not going to be enough to build machines which actually understand language. So it's a fairly simple message, hopefully, um, you'll get. So um, I remember seeing some talks a long time ago saying um, if we were able to train a really good language model, then uh, it, you know, it, it, it must mean that the, the model is, is capturing the underlying meaning and um, and so uh, it sounds like we just just train on text corpora because to, to predict the next word correctly, uh, we need to understand the, the rest of the sentence. Well, so that's nice in theory, but unfortunately, when you um, train language models, and by the way, this is true also of other NLP tasks, what happens is the models manage to get their objective function to a pretty low value, in fact, in the case of language models, pretty close to human uh, equivalent estimation of perplexity, and yet they don't seem to capture these uh, high level understanding of the world, which is necessary to really do a good job. So, um, so, that's, so that's something that, that got me thinking. Um, and of course, uh, one way to see what goes wrong in many of these systems is to look at the mistakes they make. Uh, whether it's language or image related, uh, we can look at the mistakes and often we see that it, 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 it makes us see how um, limited uh, the current systems are. Um, and a phrase that's been used by many people to talk about what's missing is common sense. But of course that can mean different things to different people. But, but essentially there are, uh, in the case of natural language, these sentences uh, like the, the uh, Winograd schemas which humans can uh, correctly interpret. For example, the women stopped taking pills because they were pregnant, and the question is, uh, what's they, uh, uh, is it the women or the pills? So, so here it's, it's pretty obvious, and if I were to change pregnant to carcinogenic, then it, it would change the answer. Um, current state-of-the-art machine learning systems do barely better than chance on these kinds of questions. So, so they're not, they, they don't have an understanding of the world around us. And again, uh, so reusing, re reusing a video that Josh used, um, it looks like our systems currently are lacking in the things that a two or three year old uh, gets very easily about the world. So whether it's intuitive physics or intuitive psychology, um, these, so, so w what are these things? So they, they, they're, they're not, uh, things that the babies have uh, been able to formalize. Like, uh, parents don't need to teach their children about this. They figure it out by themselves somehow. Maybe some of it is, is, is innate and some of it is learned. We don't know exactly where the boundary is. Um, but, but they are able to get those skills right uh, at a level which is pre-linguistic, right? So all of us have a lot of intuitive knowledge which, uh, about the world, which is part of that common sense, which we, um, we find very difficult to communicate through language. And I'll come back to this. So if we're asking how we could build machines that have the same level of understanding of language as humans, 
um, we, we need to sort of try to zoom in on what does that mean to understand a question or a document. And to me, the most basic part of the answer is knowledge, right? So in order to really make sense of the, these sentences or these questions or, or, and so on, the computer needs knowledge. And the question is that machine learning and AI in general has been trying to answer for many decades is uh, how do we get that knowledge into the computer, right? So um, to help us, I don't know, oh yeah, okay. If to help us, um, see some of the limitations of our current approaches based on large text corpora, uh, let me uh, go through a simple thought experiment with you. So let's assume you're, um, you're traveling in space and you arrive at a planet uh, and you're trying to uh, figure out uh, the language of the aliens. And, and you're able to observe the bits of information that aliens are exchanging with each other, so their language, right? So um, you could do language modeling, right? Uh, by observing those, those streams of bits. Well, unfortunately, there's a slight difference on that planet and, and the way that they communicate compared to Earth. So uh, the difference is that um, the aliens are able to communicate through a noise-free channel, which is not the case for us. We have speech, which is very noisy and so on. Um, and, and both aliens and humans have also uh, a, a cost to pay for the use of bandwidth. So, so they're gonna try to compress their message as much as possible. However, in their case, because they have a noise-free channel, they can, they can fully compress the, the signal. And, and so if you just observe the bits that are being sent, they would just look like random bits. So in other words, just observing the text uh, is, not gonna, is not gonna give us, give us anything about the meaning. Right? This is really important. Of course, you're gonna say, well, for us it's different. Um, but maybe my hypothesis is, yes, we're getting some information by just modeling text. Uh, and in fact, you can see some semantic information in like word vectors and things like that. But, but maybe we're only getting part of it. And uh, even if we saw an infinite amount of text, we would never get to the bottom of the level of understanding of those texts which uh, we have. So how could we understand this alien language? Like, what's the solution? Well, um, well, we need to do a bit more work. It's not gonna be enough to look at the bits that they're exchanging. We need to try to understand their intentions, trying to understand their context. So we need to look at modeling what they're doing and trying to figure out the causes of their uh, communications and actions. Of course, this is much harder. So we, but, but I think this is the problem we have in AI right now. We're trying, we're lazy, we're greedy, and we're trying to build something that will solve the AI problem within the next six months, right? Uh, for the next conference deadline. So it, it's just not gonna work. We have to invest on uh, solving these hard problems we could which could take decades or centuries. And in the case of the alien world problem, well, it's hard. We have to like understand the alien society and, and um, you know, it's, it, it, we have to bite the bullet. So uh, for AI, what it means is that if we wanna do natural language understanding, we have to do modeling the world. And, um, and uh, you know, that includes vision, but, but uh, understanding social interactions and many, many other things that currently, if you, if you talk to uh, a natural language uh, persons, is not really part of what they're explicitly trying to do. So I, it's pretty ambitious and it might take um, a lot of time before we, we solve these problems. Um, one interesting question is, should we, like first solve the understand the world problem, and then once we, we've dealt with that, we sort of tack the, the language part on top of it, and let's forget about natural language for the next 30 years, or should we jointly try to learn about um, the world and about language? So my, my inclination is that we should do both together, and the, the motivation for this, uh, and, and some people disagree with me, that's fine, um, uh, my inclination for this is that um, uh, we can get some clues about how the world works by looking at what humans say in some context, right? Um, so it's, I think there's some evidence by looking at supervised versus unsupervised learning and deep learning where we see that the high level features that are learned by supervised learning, say on ImageNet, are actually much better in terms of capturing high-level semantic information 
than those that we are currently able to learn with unsupervised learning methods of all kinds that we know. And I think one basic reason is because when we train those systems with just the word labels, we're already giving high-level semantic information about the concepts that, that matter to explain things in the world. And, and so we are, we're injecting that extra knowledge. So, um, so that's one reason. Another reason is thinking about uh, uh, cultural evolution. So this is something I thought about a few years ago. It, we can think of how uh, language and culture has evolved as a big optimization problem, where um, uh, it's not just an individual brain trying to figure out how the world works, but it's, it's a whole community or a, a whole group of humans through generations which are trying to decipher how the world works and using language and culture to help each other. So, um, so in this context, language could be a crucial tool also for machines. In other words, in the same way that a, a single human trying to figure out how the world works without, no, with, without, without the help of any other human might be uh, uh, experiencing a, a big challenge and, and might stay fairly dumb for the rest of their life, uh, it, maybe we will need um, humans to teach uh, and to provide uh, some, some clues about the world uh, to machines just, just like in um, Hal's uh, story. All right, um, so the system one versus system two uh, distinction was mentioned earlier this morning, and I think it's a very useful one here to think about these questions. So. Uh, Kahneman and others have tried to, dis to separate different kinds of cognitive tasks into system one and system two tasks. The system one tasks are those that you can do very quickly, like in, in half a second, like object recognition, for example. Um, and uh, they're intuitive, they're fast, they're um, uh, often heuristic, so they might be imperfect, but, but you know, they, they, do, they get the job done quickly. And, and usually they're not linguistic. It's hard for us to explain why, you know, um, why this is not a phone, even though it might you know, look a little bit like one. Um, and actually, this is touching on an interesting aspect, which is that there's a lot of knowledge about the world which uh, is encapsulated in our system one computation um, to which we don't have conscious access. And that means that the um, that this knowledge uh, is, is hardly represented explicitly in, in language. So we could collect as much uh, text as we want about people exchanging information. Uh, we might still be missing some part of our, the knowledge that is in our brain that is represented in, in uh, say, the, the system one aspects of, of our uh, mental computation. And because we, we don't need to exchange about it, all of us like, know about intuitive physics and, and, and intuitive psychology without uh, consciously knowing about it and being able to uh, to verbalize it, it would be very it would be very difficult for us to provide machines with that kind of knowledge because like even though we have it in our head, we we don't know how to express it. This is why classical uh, expert systems, I think, have failed. Uh, in addition to the lack of modeling uncertainty, uh, the, the lack of uh, being able to formalize all kinds of knowledge which is happening in the system one computation is, is a big issue. So system two is everything else, right? The, the stuff that uh, we do that is slow, sequential, logical, uh, conscious, we can talk about it, um, linguistic, and, and things like designing algorithms, right? So the, these, these are the things that um, um, we are good at in computer science. These are the things that we're uh, good at with logic, and th these are the things that classical AI, symbolic AI, was trying to deal with. Um, so I, I think we obviously need to solve those two problems, um, and, um, and I think that grounded language learning is uh, a direction of research which would allow us to really uh, get to systems that have both system one and system two capabilities. So, so grounded in some, in some environment, in some uh, observations and interactions with an environment. Um, so that part is sort of the bottom up part is, is system one. And, 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 and we want to associate that with meaning and language. So for that purpose, um, there's uh, a whole uh, direction of research in, uh, in machine learning and especially in deep learning. Um, 
that typically comes under the uh, token of deep reinforcement learning, where what people are trying to do is to design uh, learning frameworks for agents. Um, and they would then test these learning frameworks in virtual environments. So, so these are agents. They're not passively observing. And uh, I think this is a crucial ingredient that uh, in, in past work in deep learning, uh, we haven't done enough. Um, there was a discussion a little bit about causality earlier and, and intervention and counterfactuals and so on. And so, so this aspect of understanding the, the, the causal structure, at least to some extent, by being able to <laughs> intervene and seeing the effects of, of my actions, I think is, uh, is something that the deep learning community is starting to pay attention to, but much more needs to be done. Now, there is a common criticism regarding uh, that type of research, which is, oh, you're doing all this in, in virtual environments, and it's not realistic. Uh, the real world is, is much more complicated. So, so my answer to this is, well, we are very far from human-level AI. Um, what we're really after here is not to actually put the knowledge that I was talking about in the computer. This is, this is of course, the ultimate goal. But the short-term goal is to design learning mechanisms, learning procedure, learning frameworks. Um, and learning frameworks are fairly general. Uh, at least we, we try to make them as general as possible, which means that if we have something that cannot even learn in a fairly simplified environments like these 3D things, um, it, it, you know, it's very likely that it's not going to work in the real world. So, so we, we have to, to figure out how to walk before we can figure out how to run. And there's also interesting research uh, called sim to real where people train these models, these neural net models on, on in virtual environments, 3D virtual environments, and then there are some domain adaptation strategies to transport that, that learning in, in real environments where very little data will be necessary for doing that um, conversion. Okay, so, um, so let's go back to the, the causal aspect of things. Um, I think that what's going on right now in many uh, deep learning systems is that they're looking for simple clues in the data that allow uh, the, the, the learner to get the right answer on the training data. And, um, and then as soon as you test them on something sufficiently different, uh, they tend to break down. And in fact, we have some papers where we're trying to analyze the kind of features that they have learned and uh, you know, uh, what they're sensitive to. And often what we find is that they're not sensitive necessarily to the things we think they should be sensitive to. That they're, instead of capturing the objectness, for example, in images, um, they're capturing all kinds of uh, low-level clues um, that have to do with texture and, and, and the frequency of, of, of different patterns and things like that. Humans are very different. Uh, humans are actually spending a lot of mental energy trying to figure out the, the causes and, and explanations for things. Right? So this is something clearly lacking in our current systems. Um, there's, um, there's a tool, that, though, that we've been making a lot of progress on in, um, in my community, which is these deep generative models. And I think this is going to be actually very, very useful as we move forward towards building these uh, more causally motivated architectures. Because part of um, uh, what a causal agent uh, needs to do is to simulate the future in some way. And again, uh, Josh was talking about this, and I think this is really important. We have an internal mental simulator. Um, and we've made a lot of progress in the ability of training these uh, neural nets, for example, with the, the GANs and others to, uh, to sample from complicated distribution in a way that's, that's fairly uh, accurate. But that's, that's not enough. But it's going to be really important as we build these, uh, uh, these agents that are more like model-based reinforcement learning in which the agent is, is both learning a policy but also learning how to project itself into the, in the future in order to take decisions. And that's what planning is about. So this brings me, this causality discussion also brings me to um, the IID assumption that we're making in machine learning. Uh, we are assuming that the test data comes from the same distribution as the training data. Uh, and even like our, our theory is, is uh, relying on this. And currently, we're lacking 
a theory to explain how humans, for example, are able to generalize very far from the training data. For example, you can read a science fiction novel, right? And it's talking about a situation that's never happened, will never happen, um, but you, you, can, you, can, you can figure out what, you know, what would be the, uh, the sequel after you read half of the book. So, so what I'm proposing is that uh, from, from the theory point of view that we, we spend some time exploring other, um, other structures for our learning theory in which instead of assuming that uh, the, the test situations will come from the same distribution as the training situations, we only assume that they share the same causal mechanisms. So, so what does that mean? Um, so you can think of causal mechanisms as the, 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 the set of gears, right, which give rise from initial conditions to some states of the world which we can observe, right? So if we have the same causal mechanisms and the same initial conditions, we get the same distribution out. But we could assume that we only have the same mechanisms and different initial conditions. And then we get something that may be very different in appearance. Like if I'm on the moon, it's very, it looks very different from on Earth, but it's really the same laws of physics. Right? Um, and humans are able to do that. Like when, when you read the science fiction novel, we, we, there's some, some often explicitly made assumptions that uh, you know, is the beginning of the novel, and from that point on, it's just all logical, right? Good science fiction novels, anyways. Um, Okay, so let me tell you a few words about a project that we've started in, in, in my group, which tries to go a little bit in the direction that I'm talking about, and I think it's just you know one, uh, one path, and, and uh, we need a lot more people to explore many more paths. So I call this the Baby AI Game Project. And uh, the goal is to build a game which eventually real humans will play. We're not ready for that. And uh, in the game, the human will play the role of a teacher or a professor for uh, a virtual agent, which we call the baby AI uh, or the baby AI learner. And the baby AI learner lives in some environment, like a video game. Um, and the baby AI learner and the human player interact in natural language. And initially, the baby AI doesn't know much. Uh, it looks like it doesn't know anything, um, but I guess it has a little bit of prior knowledge that allows it to initiate uh, an interaction with the, the player. And the player, on the other hand, knows a lot. The player is a human. The player can play the game. Um, uh, and the player even has knowledge about pedagogy, right? Like we, we're used to teaching others. Uh, we know this intuitively, and sometimes we're, you know, we take courses to do it better. Um, and so the game is really about how the human player will uh, figure out the best way to teach that, that baby learner. Uh, for example, designing the appropriate curriculum that's going to be adapted to the behavior of the baby. Um, this game would also be interesting from a scientific point of view for a number of reasons. One of them is to collect data uh, about human-machine interactions with uh, a human in the loop. Uh, and especially natural language data of this kind. And uh, furthermore, it's not static data, right? Because the game would be played by many people. And so you could, you could uh, design experiments, like you could send your experiment to the, the, the game environment. Uh, the experiment would consist of uh, some learning procedure for the baby and maybe some, some novel levels for the game. And you could collect data about uh, how things go and thus learn something from the scientific point of view about how to design uh, better learners. This could also be used as a benchmark to uh, compare different agent learning mechanisms. Uh, and the biggest challenge from a machine learning point of view here is sample complexity. Current reinforcement learning methods are very, um, uh, demand a lot of data before they can learn very, very simple things. So uh, we actually submitted a paper on, on this, uh, uh, project at iClear, and, and we run some benchmark experiments where uh, you can easily need millions of interactions between the baby and the human uh, in order to learn some very simple things like learning to fetch things and find things in some environment. So, uh, so we've designed um, 
uh, a set of very simple right now, just 2D levels and a, a template language uh, a, that is combinatorial. So there's a, a huge number of pot potential queries that uh, missions that we could ask the, the baby to, uh, um, to solve. Um, I don't have a lot of um, time left, but let me, um, let me say a few words about what I think, another thing that's related to this uh, that we need to change in the way that we simulate the future. So I talked about these generative models which can predict the next state of the world given the current state and, and there's a lot of uh, papers doing this kind of thing. Um, and the traditional um, machine learning approach to learning uh, a model for model-based reinforcement learning or in general for modeling data sequences of, of things in the world uh, is goes like we do in, in the language model, like predict the next frame given the previous frames or um, the, the next observation given the previous observations. Um, and that sounds reasonable because when you're doing that, you're modeling the full joint distribution. However, if the goal is to build a machine which will be used by an agent to uh, uh, plan and to simulate the future in ways that are uh, useful for that agent to take decisions, I think this is completely an overkill and, and the training objective is not putting pressure in the right places. So if you observe, about, uh, if, you, if you introspect a little bit about how you plan, uh, what kinds of thoughts do you have when, when you're projecting yourself into the future, um, you realize that, well, you're not modeling in perfect detail all the pixels that are gonna come at the next time step. Um, this is not what's going on. First of all, uh, you can project yourself into the future at arbitrary points in the future. We're not modeling t, t plus one, t plus two, and so on. We, we don't even have to specify if it's t plus 20 or t plus 2000. We just know that you know, later I have to catch a flight, roughly you know, it's uh, sometime this evening, and then and next week I have this important meeting, but um, I don't remember when, but I can still plan with that in mind, right? So, so time isn't, uh, isn't uh, handled in, in this way uh, by humans. Um, and furthermore, when we think about the future, when we project ourselves, um, we don't, uh, um, we don't represent the full state of the world, like you know, the, the, the whole of details of what's gonna happen. It's impossible, right? There's so many things we can't predict. The distribution will be way too complicated and, and having a, a, just a few samples of that distribution would, would not characterize it in, in a way that's sufficiently useful. So how do we do it? So I think that the way we do it is that we focus on just a few relevant aspects of the future that matter to the plan we're thinking about. Right, so, um, so this is connected to uh, an idea that uh, is, is more like a research, another research project that's connected to the baby AI game, uh, which uh, we've started in my group, which I call the consciousness prior. And the idea is that we're gonna learn these representations with neural nets, of course, um, but uh, we're gonna distinguish two kinds of representations. So we have the traditional representations that capture a lot of information about the input and maybe the past, uh, and I call that the unconscious state. Um, but we're also gonna learn using attention mechanisms to select just a few dimensions or projections from that um, high dimensional unconscious state. Uh, to, if you can think of it like select a few dimensions or few variables that are gonna be your thought at a particular moment. So it's just, uh, think of it like a sentence in English or um, a, uh, the conditions in, in a rule, in a rule-based system. So it's just a few variables and their values, right? And we have an attention mechanism which does this selection. And um, really, what's the reason I'm calling this a prior is because, um, let's see if, no. I call this a prior because uh, the mapping that's needed from input to this uh, uh, unconscious representation is gonna have to be very special so that I can make uh, these plans about the future and, and statements about the future uh, using only a few dimensions at a time. So um, if I were to try to to uh, build these conscious thoughts that uh, allow me to make true predictions 
using directly pixels, it would be very difficult. Like I can't just pick three or four pixels and hope that I can predict one of the four pixels given the three others with high probability. However, if I make the prediction in the right semantic space, for example, if I say I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to catch this object, uh, the probability of that statement being true is very, very high. And the reason this can happen is because I'm doing it in the right level of representation where I can make these uh, very strong predictions. Um, and, and, and the prior here is that uh, there exists uh, true statements about the world, predictive or not, maybe sometimes explanatory, which can be made using just a few well-selected variables. And uh, so the prior is, is that is going to impose something on the way that we want to represent high-level uh, information. It's, it's been a little bit of my quest in the last uh, decade. How do we discover good representations? How does a learner figure out to disentangle the underlying causes and underlying factors that explain what we're observing? And so, so the idea here is to um, to take advantage of something that the classical AI people figured out a long time ago, that there's a lot of knowledge about the world which can be expressed with these very simple rules, right, that involve only a few variables at a time. And what I'm hoping is that uh, by imposing that extra um, regularizer, if you want, um, we're going to help those learners figure out more useful representations. And, um, and hopefully, bridge the gap between system one computation, which you can think of what's going on here, and system two computation, which is going on here, where we pick thoughts and we use them to, to reason and plan. All right, so I'm gonna conclude. Um, there are lots of things that are needed to move closer to human level understanding. Um, of course, things like, uh, you know, cheaper and faster and less energy hungry uh, computing um, but also fundamental changes in the way that we're thinking about learning representations, uh, learning to understand language, um, finally addressing the question of causality in our machine learning uh, methods. Um, also, something I didn't spend time on, uh, if you think about learning agents in, in these very high dimensional spaces, it's not enough to be passive. Uh, in order to discover the information that the agent needs, it's probably going to need to explore, but not explore by a random walk, explore in a smart way, like a child is, is playing and, and doing just the right things to uh, find information about the world, or think, uh, as Josh was talking about, how a scientist is doing experiments in order to acquire information. Right? So it's not random experiments, and then uh, we hope something good comes out of it. There's, there's sort of uh, uh, planning that goes on in, in the act of acquiring information actively. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Is it fair to say that the consciousness prior is a sparse prior on a set of latent and conscious state? Yes, except that the sparsity is dynamic, right? And it's controlled by, by this controller that, that decides what we're thinking of at, at any particular time, right? So yeah, it's totally about sparsity, but it, it's, a, it's a dynamic sparsity. It's not always the same things that are going to be um, activated based on context. But yeah, it's, it's a good, it's a good uh, statement. Next one, um, are there any results where your proposed relaxation of IID yielded formal results? Um, no, I'm hoping that uh, people will tackle this problem. I don't have the answer to it, but I feel like it's, it's, it's a direction for extending learning theory. And, and yeah, we need, we need to, uh, to do this uh, technically and formally. The next one, uh, can you discuss the need for integrating different sensory perceptions to ground language learning? How can it be done? So, um, so, so I think we have to be coming back to the question of knowledge, right? So, so uh, I don't think that it's so important to have many sensory modalities. What matters is that the sensory modalities give a, a view on the environment uh, that's sufficient for an agent to uh, figure out how the environment works. So, um, 
as a, as a counterexample, I think that when we do grounded language learning by trying to associate sentences with images, it's insufficient. It's insufficient because a static image uh, you know, doesn't give us enough information about the environment. Uh, even if you train with lots of, is, of this, these images, it's going to be difficult for the learner to figure out, for example, the 3D nature of things uh, simply by looking at these images. So you'd need at least that agent to be in an environment maybe with stereo vision or sequences of images so that it gets a chance uh, maybe actively to figure out the, the, object, uh, the objectness of things in 3D and so on. So, so it's, it's not about the number of sensory perceptions, but that the sensory perceptions are rich enough to uh, 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 allow the learner to figure out the, the concepts that matter in that environment. The next one, do you see grounded, oops, someone, so, something disappeared. All right, the genetics algorithms also focus on the causal effects through evolutionary something. What are the pros and cons of baby AI in compared to genetics algorithms? Uh, I, think, I think this is just addressing different questions. So genetic algorithms are uh, about optimization. And here I'm thinking about a uh, framework in which we can evaluate different agent learning mechanisms and, and grounded language learning. Uh, next one, have you made connections to researchers in symbolic AI who have been working on these problems for decades? Um, not recently, but you know, I'm old enough that when I took uh, AI classes, it was all about classical AI and symbolic AI. So I, I, I have some uh, knowledge of that, but you're right, I, 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 should, I should reach out more to these people. And I've started to reach out more to people on the uh, side of uh, cognitive science and neuroscience, I think, uh, and, and child development. I think uh, this, uh, these uh, people have to teach me a lot that's relevant here. And next one, vocabulary is often a measure of intelligence in humans. Oh, I don't like that. <laughs> How does increase of vocabulary af affect learning models? Um, yeah, I, I don't know how to answer this. So I can tell you about an experiment we run a long time ago where uh, we, s we were able to speed up the, the training of um, of a language model by doing a curriculum where we started with a, a small vocabulary of free, the most frequent words, and then we gradually increase the size of the vocabulary. Um, so, so I think the thing with vocabulary for me is, is not about how big it is, but uh, what it represents uh, from the point of view of the learner uh, about the, the aspects of the world that are, that are being understood by, by the learner, right, by the agent. So, uh, for me, small vocabulary presumably means there are few concepts in the world that I understand, or at least that I'm able to talk about. And I think as children understand more and more things, then they are able to put words on these things. That's, so so it, that, uh, that's, that's how I would put it. And next one, substantial increase in computing power is needed. I agree. What hardware is best in your mind? Well, uh, there's you know, short term and long term things here. So in the short term, uh, there are lots of people who are doing, I think, what's the right thing to do in the short term, which is to de design digital circuits that are um, really uh, meant for doing the kind of calculations that are currently done, say, in, in deep learning. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we'll get very significant speed up in the next few years using these approaches. Companies you know, are already put out, putting out some chips. But in the longer run, I think we may need to really uh, explore very different kind of even devices. Uh, I think we need to go analog to some degree, uh, but this, this requires uh, uh, longer-term investments and, uh, and have some, some research going in that direction as well.